Hi friends, my guest today is Dr. Ivan Meissner, founder and chief visionary officer of BNI, Business Network International, the world's largest business networking organization. He is a New York Times bestseller author who has written 25 books, including one of his latest books, Who's in Your Room? He's also a columnist for theentrepreneur.com and has been a university professor as well as a member of the Board of Trustees for the University of Laverne. Life begins at 40, welcomes the guru of networking, Dr. Ivan Meissner. So Dr. Um, Meissner, in a world seemingly ridden with distrust, b &I encourages, facilitates and creates an environment of trust. What is the world, larger world order that b &I nurtures? Well, that's a great question, Sanjana, and, and please call me Ivan um, in the interview. I'm happy to, to have you call me Ivan. Uh, you know, I think our worldview is predicated on a, a philosophy that we have uh, called giver's gain. It's one of our core, principal core values. And th this core value is all about really um, helping other people, and that by helping other people that they'll help you in return. And giver's gain to me is, is much more than a phrase. It's a way of living one's life. It's a perspective to view and interact with the world. It's an attitude, not an expectation. And when it's applied properly, it'll change your life. And when it changes enough lives, it'll change the world. And this is one of the things that I think is special about BNI, because you could go to any BNI chapter anywhere in the world, and if you said to them, what's BNI's philosophy in two words? you would hear them in all the different languages we operate in. You would hear almost every chapter say, giver's game. Absolutely. That's really special. I mean, I don't know too many organizations in the world where you could go in and say, what's, what's the philosophy of this company and have everyone tell you what it is. And I think that's the reason why we've had the, some of the success that we've had. Your new book, Infinite Giving, seems to qualify this too. It does. It's brand new. It just came out. It's available on Amazon. Um, Infinite Giving, it's about the seven principles of giver's gain. I had two BNI directors in the United Kingdom come to me with the idea of, of doing this book. And um, we really sat down and thought about what, what are the principles that one must apply yeah. in order to live a giver's gain um, attitude. Yeah. in order to be infinite giving. And, you know, we came up with a list of, of principles um, like, you know, under promising and over delivering, giving, giving more than, than people might expect. Uh, understanding that it's okay to gain. It's two phrases, givers gain. And it's okay to gain when you've built a relationship with somebody. Um, we talk about gratitude, that gratitude is part of uh, that, that givers gain philosophy. We talk about humility. We talk about humility in, is one of the principles, you know, that, that a humble person doesn't think less of themselves. They just think of themselves less. And that is an important aspect of the philosophy of giver's gain. So we're really excited about the book. And um, I'm really thankful that the two directors came to me to, with the idea. Congratulations on that. So uh, why only small and medium-sized uh, businesses? Yeah, that's a common belief, but actually we have many, many different sized businesses in BNI. Um, we have large, large companies, big real estate companies, banks, um, you know, telecommunications companies, but they're not the senior executives. They're the salesperson, the sales manager. Right. They're the person out there who's, who's developing the business uh, in the field. So really BNI is almost a third, a third, a third, not quite, but there are entrepreneurs, small business owners, right. you know, local entrepreneurs. There are professionals like lawyers, accountants, medical professionals. And then the other third, maybe just a little less than that is the big corporations, but it's the salespeople for the big corporations. So we, we really have a, a dramatic mix uh, of businesses in BNI. You've got the whole world in BNI, so to say. Pretty much. If, if yeah. you have a product or service that you're making available to people, uh, BNI is a great uh, outlet for you. 
it's a 25 books and over 20, 20 years. I'm sure you've uh, had your challenges on your way to success. Yeah. Yeah, you know, I think a lot of people look at someone who's achieved some level of success and they, they either think they're lucky or they think that they haven't had, um, you know, the same kinds of problems they've had. Right. And they may not have had the same problems, but trust me, you have problems. I tell people I'm a 20-year overnight success. It took me years to build my business. And I ran through massive challenges, you know, getting, trying to get, first of all, our membership entrepreneurs and, and, you know, uh, uh, salespeople, it's like herding cats. Everybody wants to do things differently and getting everyone on the same page, doing the same thing at the same time can be very challenging. And it was in the beginning, but I had financial challenges just like everyone else. Uh, at one point I had six weeks of my paychecks uh, on my desk that I couldn't cash because I was paying my employees. I was paying my vendors, but I couldn't pay myself because if I did, the checks would start bouncing. Yeah. And so, um, you know, I ran through problems like anyone. Our biggest challenge was transitioning from a paper-based system to online where we had all of our countries on one platform, which we now have, BNI Connect. And of course, COVID. Oh, my goodness. You know, I think everyone in the world has been severely impacted by that. Yeah. But in the middle of this COVID, I like to call it the great pause. I don't like to call it, you know, the quarantine or lockdown because it's so negative. I think mindset is really important. Mm. And I like to call this the great pause because the pause button has been put, has been hit on our lives in many ways. Even during the great pause, our BNI members so far this year have generated over 10.3 billion US dollars worth of business for each other. In the middle of COVID, people are going out of business, but we have BNI people who are there doing business throughout all of this. So um, I think with the right attitude and the right system, amazing things can happen. And what I see is that there are some members who I think do very well. And what is the one mistake you witness leaders making more frequently than the others? So I think that there, there are many, there as many mistakes as there are people out there. There's a lot of ways to make a mistake in, in a business. But right. I think the one I see the most is uh, not understanding a concept that I've talked about for a long time. And that is that if you want to be successful in business, you have to do, you have to do six things a thousand times. Right. Not a thousand things six times. Six things a thousand times. All too often, I see business people chasing bright, shiny objects. We're like, oh, let's try this idea. Or, oh, here's another idea. No, wait a minute. This is a, and they bounce around doing all of these different things instead of doing, and it's, by the way, it doesn't have to be six. It could be five. It could be seven. It's just a handful of things that you do over and over and over again. So the question people ask me is, what are the right things? Well, I can't tell you what the right things are for you and your business, but yeah. you can figure it out by having mentors. Real in-person mentors, people that you know and trust, virtual mentors, shows like this are a great opportunity for you to listen to virtual mentors who give you nuggets of ideas that you can then go and apply and apply consistently over and over and over again. If I have any superpower as a business person, okay. my superpower is that I am a dog with a bone. I just work something and work something and work something until I can get what I, what I want from it. And I think that's a, a really an important secret to success. Six things a thousand times. So, uh, which uh, takes us to the next question. What are the resources you would recommend to someone looking to gain insights into becoming a better leader? Let me start with this. Right. I first studied uh, at the University of Southern California under Warren Bennis, who was in his day the world's leading expert on leadership back in the, in the 80s and 90s. <clears throat> uh, today, I think that mantle is held by uh, John Maxwell. And um, I've met John many times. Uh, he's an amazing individual. He is absolutely the world's leading expert on the subject of leadership. I would urge anyone who wants to be a better leader to pick up a copy of any one of his books, but my favorite of his is the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. The 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership. 
Uh, I've met many leaders in my lifetime. I've met many people who did leadership team training. Yes. I've never met anyone as the, at the caliber of Warren Bennis and John Maxwell. Outstanding content, I'd recommend it. And by the way, anyone who's in BNI, we have a system called BNI University. And John and I have done about 20 videos. So if you're a BNI member, you can go to BNI University and you can watch John and I talk about leadership. Right. Um, and this is the kind of value add content that BNI provides people so that they get better and better at what they do. Wonderful. So it's, it's available to all BNI members? All BNI members. They get it automatically. It's free. It's part of their membership. It's called BNI University. Uh, and what we try to do at BNI University is, you know, we don't teach networking in colleges and universities anywhere in the world. Yeah. We just don't teach it. And so what we've tried to do at BNI University is first and foremost, teach people how to be an effective member in BNI. That's first and foremost. Then we want to teach leadership team members how to effectively lead a BNI group. But then on top of that, we want to give other value added content like general leadership like through John Maxwell and, and other things that are part of BNI University. Wonderful. So um, we, you spoke about the COVID-19 and how BNI has immediately snapped back into action. So uh, has it affected a lot of the businesses that are part of BNI and connected with it? And well, I think, you know, COVID has affected just about everyone in the world in yes. one way or another. But yes. what's amazing is that we were able to get all 9,700 in-person meetings, uh, weekly meetings. I mean, I don't know of any business that was disrupted more. There right. have been businesses disrupted as much, but not more. When you have 9,700 9, locations that meet in person every week, wow, we had to pivot on a dime and, and switch to online meetings. Mm. So I, I am so happy that, um, and I'm so proud of our BNI members and directors mm. for having stepped up and said, okay, we can do this and right. to transition. And I honestly think we have hundreds of thousands of people who not only survived this crisis, but they have actually thrived Right. during this crisis. They have done business. I mean, I know, I know a furniture manufacturing, uh, a furniture reupholstering place in the United States that um, when COVID hit, she had to let go of all of her employees. And, and one of the things we told our members to do was sit down and do you know, virtual one-to-ones and ask for advice and brainstorm. And she did a one-to-one -one with somebody and found, so, and that person said, well, you've got a lot of cloth, don't you? And she said, well, I literally have tons, tons of cloth. Mm -hmm. And the person said, well, have you thought about maybe manufacturing COVID masks? And wow. she said, no. And he said, well, why don't you try it? And so she went back and she made a hundred masks and then she gave them to all of her BNI members. Mm -hmm. She gave two to each one. And she said, one's for you. And I ask for a favor for the second one. Give it to a healthcare worker. Give it to a hospital. Give it to a nursing home. Give it to somebody who needs these and tell them where they can get more. She was able to go back and rehire all of her employees and get the, 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 the shop working again with a little bit of physical distancing and everybody wearing masks but she was able to rehire all of her people and keep the business alive. I'll tell you one more quicker. Yes. Um, we had a brewery made beer in Australia who, um, you know, all the bars were shut down. Yeah. So he didn't know what he was going to do. He had a conversation with someone and they said, well, you have a lot of alcohol, right? And he said, <laughs> I have a lot of alcohol. He said, have you thought about making hand sanitizer? Yeah. Oh, oh my goodness. No, he said, you should, you know, switch to be in a, a hand sanitizer production facility. And he did. And he was able to rehire all of his employees. So there are so many amazing stories about people thinking outside the box with the help of their business friends, with the help of their BNI colleagues to not only survive, but to thrive. It's, it's, not only possible, I'm seeing it done. And I'm just so proud of our BNI members. Three must to build a successful business. 
your advice to people? The three things, you know, again, every business is a little bit different. I think um, one, one would be do six things a thousand times. That's really, really important. You want to build a successful business. I think another one, especially in the beginning, this is really important. And you're starting a business. I really believe that ignorance on fire is better than knowledge on ice. Let me repeat that. Ignorance on fire is better than knowledge on ice. Meaning that um, you may not be able to afford the most expensive person to help you in that business. Uh, you can't afford knowledge on fire. That's, that's you know, really what you want. But, but I would rather hire somebody that is on fire, but maybe not an expert. But they're a sponge. They're willing to learn they want to learn. They're excited to learn. And you, you hire ignorance on fire rather than knowledge on ice, rather than somebody who's like, yeah, I'd like the job. And yeah, I, you know, somebody who's too laid back. I want somebody that's excited. And I'd rather train them on how to do something. And I say that because I think of, of me when I started BNI, I didn't know how to network. I had no idea how to network. I was the poster child for ignorance on fire. I may not have known how to network, but I was passionate about doing it. You know, when I started BNI in 1985, we had no materials. I had no marketing materials. I had no brochures, no visitor information sheets. Forget about the internet. That didn't exist. There were no websites, no email. You know what I did? I opened 20 chapters, 20 in one year. Do you know what I had, Sanjana? I had one sheet of paper. That's all I had. All I had was one sheet of paper. It was the agenda yeah. typed up by me on an IBM Selectric typewriter. I don't even, you're not, you're not old enough to know what one of those things are. <laughs> hey, they're anchors for boats. They were so heavy. But, and, and I typed, I, I typed Columbus style back then, you know, seek out. <laughs> <and just, laughs> I didn't know how to type. It was the agenda. And people would say to me, well, do you have some, I'd invite them to a, a meeting and they'd say, well, do you have some marketing material? I, I said, I said, no, but you got to come and, and experience, you got to experience the meeting. And they'd say, well, surely you have some marketing material. I said, no, no, no. You, it, it's really about experiencing the meeting. And they'd say, come on, you have to have something. So I said, well, I got the agenda and they'd look at it and they go, well, this doesn't tell me about the experience. And I, and I'd say to them, you're right. It doesn't, you have to come to a meeting. And I was able to open 20 chapters with no stuff. That's what I mean about passion. Is that you can do so much with passion. And so when you're hiring people and looking for people, we, you need to be passionate about your own company, which is the third thing that I'll give you. Hmm. Entrepreneurs need to work in their flame and not in their wax. They need to work in their flame and not in their wax. When an entrepreneur is working in their flame, they're excited. They love what they're doing. They're passionate about what they're doing. You can hear it in their voice. You can see it in the way they behave. Mm. When they're working in their wax, it takes all their energy away. Yeah. It's, it's just, you know, it, it, it's taxing on them. And you can hear that in their voice and you can see that in the way they behave. And so as an entrepreneur, it's very important to find out what your flame is and do everything in your power to work towards achieving that where you're working primarily in your flame. Now, I just one warning to everybody. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do to get to do what you want to do. And so sometimes you got to work in that wax for a while until you grow to the point where you can hire somebody where your wax is their flame. And when that happens and you're able to hire people to take care of your wax, then you get to work in that flame. And by the way, this is my flame. I love sharing with people. I love pouring into people. And so those would be the three things that I would say you know, you don't learn that in school. All three of them are critical to success in business. Okay, so yes. moving on to slightly lighter things, some insights into Ivan now. What are the three words that define you? 
Oh, uh, inspire, persistent, and harmony. And we've talked about the persistent. We haven't talked about inspire. Inspire, yeah. I, I want to inspire people to inspire other people. Creating more leaders. Yeah, that's what I want to do. I want to inspire people to inspire other people. And harmony is, I use the word harmony because, you know, people are often talking about balance. What's the secret to balance mm. in life? And I, and I wrote about this in one of my books, uh, Who's in Your Room, which is about surrounding yourself with the right people. Right. In, in that book, I say, forget about balance. You can never have balance. Balance is elusive. Uh, you know, we look at balance as the you know, scales where your personal life is in balance with your business, which is in balance with your spirituality, which is in balance with your health. And, you know, life's too crazy for that. Life is a, is a, is a juggling act, right. not, a, not a scale. And so um, while I don't think balance is possible, I do believe in harmony. And, and this is more than semantics. Even the graphic for harmony, the yin and the yang yeah. are out of balance if you separate them. Mm. And so I believe that you can have a life that's not in balance, but is in harmony. And we talk in, in, in Who's in Your Room, how to get there. I'll give you one of the techniques we talk about. One of the techniques of living a life in harmony is be here now. Wherever you are, be there now. Don't be at work thinking about the fact that you didn't spend time with the family last night and you're beating yourself up. Don't be at home thinking about that work project that's got to get done. Wherever you are, be fully present to that moment. And the better you are at that, the more you create a life of harmony and you can release this concept that your life is in balance or not in balance. And it's so hard to do, but the more you can do it, the, the, the better you get at it. Absolutely. Seven core values that have led to your success. You know, I believe that um, many of the BNI's core values um, I kind of brought to the table because they were my core values. They, I believed in those, and so the values that we have in BNI uh, are the, our principal core value of givers gain, the giving to other people. I think that's what makes BNI really set it apart from other networking organizations. Building relationships, that's, that's number two. It's all about building relationships with people. Uh, if your network is a mile wide and an inch deep, it'll never be powerful. Your network needs to be both wide and in places deep where you have deep, meaningful relationships. I'm a big believer in lifelong learning. I think that uh, one should always be learning something new podcasts of uh, broadcasts like this are exactly what I'm talking about. Yeah. Is that, you know, it's about learning and improving oneself. Um, fourth would be um, traditions. I, I call it traditions and innovation and in BNI. Traditions. I think traditions are important. Traditions tell us who we are and where we come from. Innovations tell us where we want to go. Both are important. And um, we talk about both of those in BNI. I think accountability is important. Hockey, you know, ice hockey. Hockey without rules would be boxing on ice. <laughs> you know, it, I don't know if you know hockey at all, but it's very violent. The, the sport is very physical. And so you got to have rules. Well, it's the same in life. You know, there has to be systems and accountability. Uh, and so I'm a believer in that. And the last is recognition. I, I believe in gratitude. I believe in showing gratitude. We talk about it in the infinite giving. Yes. And I think recognition is a powerful way of, of, of thanking people for efforts that they've made. Those are my, my personal core values and the core values of BNI. and uh, They very consistently and strongly come through if one attends a BNI meeting. Yeah. I, I, I would like to think that the really good chapters absolutely that it comes through consistently. Your hobbies. So I love to play chess. Um, started in India, uh, the game of chess. And uh, love chess. I've, I've played since I was a little boy. I love astronomy. I've got a really nice telescope. And on a good clear night, I pull the telescope out. There's, not, there's just something amazing about seeing the red spot on Jupiter through an eye. <laughs> and it's not even as, as you know, good as a photograph. You know, they, they, they digitally enhance photographs. Yeah. yeah. And um, or the rings of Saturn. Oh, my goodness. 
to see those through an eyepiece, it's just, uh, it's just amazing. So astronomy, and I would say fine art. Uh, when I was in college, I took an art, uh, an art appreciation course, and I remember seeing art that I thought, oh, you know, I'll never be able to have pieces like that. This, this is just so beautiful. And today my home is full, just full of fine art from amazing artists. And, um, you know, I wrote a blog years ago, uh, you know, um, the, the, there's a saying, home, home is where the heart is. Uh, I like to say home is where the art is. <laughs> Wherever my art is, that is where my home is. And my wife and I have a very eclectic taste. We mm. like different styles and, it, and we have many different pieces here. So those would be my, my hobbies. Fabulous. So you have pieces from uh, artists across the world? Yeah, um, many from all across the world. Um, we have uh, pieces from um, the United Kingdom. Of course, we have pieces from the United States. We have pieces from France. Um, you know, there, we have a piece from Australia. It was really funny. We went to Australia probably seven, eight years ago. And, you know, shipping art from Australia is expensive. And so when we go places, we'll walk into galleries. But this was so far away, we looked at each other and we said, okay, this is, there's a gallery here. You're going to go in and have your nails done next door. I'm going to go through the gallery. But, but we're not going to buy any art, okay? And she's like, we're not going to buy any art. So she went in, she had her nails done. I walked through the place. It was one of the largest galleries I've ever seen. They must have had 100 pieces. Wow. She came out and she said, well, was the gallery nice? I said, it was, it was very nice, but there was just one piece that just jumped out at me, but I'm not going to buy it. We're not going to buy it. She said, okay, well, let me just walk through and see what happens. She walked through a hundred pieces. She yeah. stopped at the same piece and said, oh my goodness, that's just beautiful. And I was like, okay, <laughs> we got to buy it. And so that's, that's up in our bedroom. Um, th there's been two pieces that my wife in our lifetime looked at and started to cry. She just started to cry. She's just like, oh, it's just so beautiful. I'm like, okay, I can't leave this gallery without that piece of art. You know, if that brings tears to my wife's eyes because she thinks it's so beautiful. So th that's the kind of art we buy. And it, it's very, you know, each piece is different. Some is hundreds of years old. Um, some is, you know, brand new. Lovely. By the way, I've talked more to you about this topic than I've talked to anybody in an interview yet. And I'm fascinated. Next time you're in India, I'm going to take you to see some Indian art. Yes, I would love to. You know, I've never been to a gallery in India. Uh, so uh, I'll need to do that. I've been to India three or four times. Love, we, we love going to India. We really, really do. Um, the BNI members there are amazing. The people are incredible, so friendly. Um, the, the service is amazing at, at hotels. Um, so um, what has been your favorite holiday spot so far? Well, you know, look, um, I used to say home because I travel so much. Just being yeah. home was great. I mean, I have 2.3 million miles just on one airline. But, um, you know, other than home, I think probably my favorite spot is Necker Island in the Caribbean. It's uh, Richard Branson's private island. And my wife and I have had an opportunity to go there uh, three times and yeah. um, we've been able to be there when Richard, when yeah. Sir Richard is there and had some amazing experiences. If you go to my blog, IvanMeisner.com, go back to January, just before COVID started to hit, we were there and I have a video of Richard and I uh, on my blog at IvanMeisner.com back in January, where we were talking about his book um, uh, on, um, on, um, I, did. I think it's called losing losing my virginity. <laughs> yes, and, and so uh, we're talking about his book, and, and he's such a nice guy. He's very friendly, very genuine. Yes, uh, amazing um, man. And I'll tell you what, uh, something about him. What you see is what you get. He's a very um, he's very amiable, and he's he's amazing at being able to talk to a CEO, a head of state and then turn around and talk to a day worker 
uh, at his facility and treat them both the same way. To treat them both res with respect, to treat them, to talk to them with respect. Um, I've seen him do it on many occasions when, when he thought no one was looking and he was talking to somebody who was working and he just uh, spoke to them so respectfully and he spoke to them with gratitude. Uh, on, on several occasions, he was thanking people for the hard work they were doing on some specific thing and telling them why it was so important to him yeah. that this be done. He didn't have to do that. You know, I've met a lot of people a lot less wealthy than him saying, hey, come on, you know, pick it up, go faster. You're not doing enough. But, but he, he just stops and he pours into people. Um, yeah, I have the highest respect for Branson. So I actually did go visit your blog, but you are such an effusive writer. There's just so much to read that I, my, I didn't have enough brains to absorb it all. I'll tell you the secret. Right. Just write twice a week hmm. for 13 years and you get lots of stuff. <laughs> I mean, I've been doing my blog since 2007. So, you know, if you're just consistent, it's about consistency. It's about six things a thousand times. And if you're consistent, then, you know, people look at it and go, oh my goodness, how could you write so much? You know, yeah. I just write a little bit over a long period. Your favorite drink to be able to write so much? <laughs> <laughs> favorite drink. Well, yeah, I definitely have a favorite drink. Um, I, my, my, I, I love wine. Absolutely love wine. Another course I had as an undergraduate in college right. was wines. And, and I took it because I had to have a lab class and most of the labs were math and I don't like math. So I figured I didn't like wine, but I thought, well, wine's got to be better than math. <laughs> so I took this wine class and I acquired a taste for nice you know, good wines. And so uh, I would say a Cabernet Sauvignon is probably my favorite uh, wine. So, you know, in the evening, um, my wife and I call it wine o'clock. And at wine o'clock, we go up, we have a tower on our house and we go up on the tower and we watch as the deer walk by and the animals and, and um, we have a good Cabernet. Your favorite sport? If I had to pick one, it would be the one thing I did for, um, a large part of my adult life, and that was martial arts. Um, I have a, uh, a black belt in karate. Uh, it's wow. been a long time since I've, I've um, practiced because of my travel. But yeah, martial arts, I loved karate. Something that always brings you joy? Movies. Oh. I, so this is something, you know, it's like one of those uh, 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 Things that you, 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 you don't necessarily want everybody to know. What do you call that? Uh, where, you know, it's your secret pleasure. Um, I love movies. I love to watch movies. And, um, and, and I, you know, I loved, uh, my daughter in particular loved movies. And so I would try to find old movies for her that had a strong female lead. And, yeah. and she and I would watch these old movies together. But yeah, movies, there, there are like, there are three movies that every time I see them on TV, I, I, I look at it and go, no, I'm not going to watch that this time. I've seen it. <laughs> I love the scene. This is such a great scene. And then I end up watching the whole movie for the 10th time. <laughs> There's three in particular that I just really love. Would you like to tell us what those three movies are? Sure. My, my three favorite, you'll, you'll love one of them. Um, my three favorite movies in the entire world are Lawrence of Arabia, oh. Gandhi, Oh, okay. Gandhi, and the King's Speech. The King's Speech. Right. Haven't seen them. Right. I didn't think of that as I was watching them, but later I thought, oh my goodness, they all have kind of a similar theme, completely different context, but Absolutely. different scene. Beautiful. So um, something that you would never do, never ever. Uh, eat something I don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I get people all the time. Oh, you got to try this. It's fantastic. Yeah. And, uh, and you know, I just, I'm very, no is a one word sentence. Uh, and I'm good standing by no. I changed my diet uh, substantially about eight years ago. I was diagnosed with cancer. 
And uh, I was told I had six months to, uh, to get surgery or radiation. And um, it's been eight years and I have never had to do surgery, radiation or chemotherapy. I completely changed my diet. I lost almost 45 pounds and wow. um, went into remission, mm. having not had to do any of that. And so today, you know, I get people who say, oh, you got to try this. Uh, and, you know, you know it's, a sh- it's just sugary treat, a piece of pie or cake. And, uh, you know, I don't care how much they, you know, browbeat me. Uh, it's a no. Thank you very much. You know, I, sometimes I'll say to them, just one bite? Because they'll say, just one bite. I'll say, just one bite? And they'll say, yes. I say, great, you have it. <laughs> so, um, but what, incidentally, what is your favorite food? Oh, my wife is such an amazing chef. There's so many great meals that she makes for me. It's hard to it's hard to nail it down. I certainly, you know, I used to love a uh, you know like a filet mignon with a with a uh, cabernet, but yeah. I don't I don't do red meat much uh, anymore. Um, oh, what's my favorite dish? I I okay. I'll tell you what my favorite one is right now. Yeah. In our last visit to India, my wife came back learning how to make uttapam. Okay. Am I, pro- am I yeah. pronouncing that right? Bang on. <laughs> yeah. And so she makes it here for me. Oh. Wow. Yeah, she makes it with Indian spices. And, and yeah, it's made round uttapam. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yes. Wow, and wow. Right now, that's my favorite because uh, that's new in her repertoire of, uh, of uh, cooking. Last but not least, are your children following your footsteps? You know, I always told them, um, do what you, if you do what you love, you'll love what you do. Mm. And if BNI draws you, I'd love to have you as part of BNI, but you don't do BNI because I've done BNI, do what you're passionate about. Mm. They listen to me. <laughs> <laughs> and so none of them have gone into BNI. They all worked for BNI at one point, you yeah. know, so they, they, they knew what BNI was. They worked there, but they never, uh, that was not the, the passion that they had. You know, my, my two daughters are very artistic and they, um, they do art. And my son is a game programmer. He, he, started his own little indie game programming company. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's what they do. And I'm, I'm very proud of them. And, and I'm proud of the fact that they, they did what they are passionate about. So, uh, lastly, your five-year vision for BNI. Well, I believe that um, we will have well over 12,000 chapters in the next five years. When I started BNI, it was in 1986, somebody asked me, how many chapters do you think BNI could have someday? And we had, we had 30. I had 30 chapters in 1986, middle of 1986. Yes. And I said, you know, I've been thinking about that. I think someday BNI could have 10,000 chapters. And the guy's eyes widened as big as saucers. <laughs> He's <Yeah>. like, <laughs> excuse me? I said, I think, I think BNI can have 10,000 chapters. And he said, and how many chapters do you have now? I said, 30. He said, you think you could have 10,000 chapters? I said, yeah, I I think so. And I remember he said to me, well, it's good to have goals, Ivan. Very good to have goals. And I I knew he was thinking, you're crazy. There's no way. Well, here we are today, Sanjana. 9,700 chapters. Yes. 300 chapters short of what I thought was possible 35 years ago, 34 years ago. And, um, and so I think we will easily be over 12,000 chapters within the next five years. Very Maybe as many as 14,000. Beautiful. Beautiful. And, and the, the beauty of that is we're helping more members. Yes. You know, and that's the key is to help local communities build their economy. And those communities build regions and those regions build countries and those countries build a world that is more economically sound. And that is our vision is to help change the way the world does business through this philosophy of giver's gain. It's incredible. So it's like one large global community with same values yet working in regional contexts. Yes. Yes. And, and when you go to a BNI convention, 
It's like going to a United Nations meeting, except yeah. everyone likes each other. You know? <laughs> they all get along. It's, but it is. It's, you see the flags of all the different countries. You hear yeah. the different accents. You hear the different languages. Uh, and they all are brought together with the same vision and the same mission. It has been and an so absolute delight interacting with you. I am honored and I'm very, very happy and grateful that you gave me the time. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. I, I appreciate it.